and there are some questions on there. I was able to read most of them, or be able to read most of them. Maybe we need some help from you, the people who wrote it down. Um, yeah, so the idea is that we're actually uh, going to answer your questions. Uh, maybe it's also nice if you, if we read it, then you maybe put up your hand so we know who the, who the question asked, so we can maybe have some in-depth answers as well. Um, all right, so let's start with the first one. The first question is how to deploy it. Victor will can do the can do the answer that one. Okay, um, yeah, how to deploy it? We deploy it. You can deploy it using any process manager. Uh, for example, supervisor it will be okay. The way to deploy Volto is that you have to deploy Plone as you normally do that, and then you have to deploy uh, the SSR server uh, that uh, Volto um, builds on the build process, and you just have to run this uh, JavaScript that is the bundle, the server.js bundle, you have to run it with Node. And yeah, as I said, you can use whatever process manager that you are uh, f familiar with, or with systemd also, there are people that does that without yeah, just systemd running things and stopping things. We do it uh, using PM2. PM2 is something is a process manager that is uh, done with uh, Node. And we started uh, from the beginning. I think that we never tried anything else for Volto itself. And then when there was all this uh, thing about uh, the release of uh, Supervisor D uh, for Python 3 and the maintainer wasn't uh, very eager to release it, then there was problems, then I started to, we started to deploy Plone as well with PM2, because why not? I mean, yeah, it's a Node uh, tool but it can run whatever uh, process that you want, right? And PM2 is a great tool. It has a lot of uh, features, even the paid ones, because they also live from doing uh, premium services. But, uh, and it's very nice, and we are very, very, very happy with it. Uh, I think that in the documentation we have a, a section. It's very raw, we have to improve it, but you can go there and, and take a look how to do that. Then another thing that I mentioned in my training is that uh, you have to deploy your main Volto site in, in one in the, your DNS server, but then you have to make available Plone also for the clients because the client's browsers are going to hit Plone REST API. So normally what we do is to set up the same server and the API folder for Plone directly. And I think that's it. What? Yeah, should be said about. I think so too. Yeah, we can we go have now. More, we have more questions. <laughs> <laughs> so, whose question was that? Yeah, you got a correct answer, right answer. Yeah. Enough. So, a for yeah, it's about cores, right? Yeah, about course, if you have a deployment and you have such a deployment as, as I said, so you have the server name and then in the API, the course then doesn't jump because you're using the same server name and then you don't have to worry about course. So Avoid course at all costs, that, that's our experience. Yeah, just simply don't deal with that. Just use the same name as your main server because yeah, just better. Yep. All right, uh, next, well, kind of question. It's more like a uh, like statement. Show us some case studies. Um, sure, so we have a, uh, Timo can probably answer that better, but he has a talk tomorrow, I think, in the afternoon, which will be a case study, and he just added it to the repo, I think. You can say, yeah. Absolutely, yeah. I created a pull request. I reviewed it myself and nurtured myself. Uh oh. Uh, so. <laughs> <laughs> but I wanted to have it for this panel, right? Um, so, uh, yeah, you can blame me and, and punch me later. Um, so, yeah, we, I mean, we have like four public Volto projects that have like uh, public websites. Uh, the other ones we're not allowed to like share or talk about. Um, and I know like a few like companies that also did Volto projects and I will like try to like get them to add their uh, their sites up there as well. 
Um, and yeah, just check out the, the, the readme, right? Maybe at some point we should also uh, publish uh, case studies uh, on plon.com, right, for Volto. I guess that would make lots of sense. Um, yeah, so it's, it's there, I guess. Um. Yeah, and there were some other talks as well, <coughs> I think, with case studies. I think just, no, today was one, yesterday. Yeah. Yep. So, uh, Nic Nicola did a talk right. today. Yeah. yeah, indeed, today. Yeah. All right, then a really long question. So the question is, do you have a plan for non-UI, non-admin package? It means only having API and router as core package. Um, yeah, I can answer that one. So basically the question is, um, so we, we have, of course, the REST API, and there is some code in Volto which handles all the backend calls and has some helpers methods there uh, and routing. Um, and do we provide a package with just that information? Um, well, no, we're not going to provide a separate package, but you can just use Volto and only import that part of the package. Uh, so you don't need to uh, uh, use the whole machinery uh, of Volto. Uh, you can just import uh, the actions, the reducers, um, and routers, and, and the routes. Uh, and you can basically write your own uh, front end, uh, whether that be in React or in Angular or Vue or jQuery, whatever, um, so that you can do, and you don't need to uh, split up the package. You can just import only the stuff you actually need, um, and that should work. Whose question was that? Yeah? Good? Yeah? All right. And I think that it's even feasible with Create Portal App, uh, I mean, with the overrides. Yeah, you can I even mean, do it with I the mean, boilerplate. I, I think that it's doable. Yeah. I, I never tried, but... Yeah. All right, next question is how to extend it. Who wants to do That's that a one? complex one, so you go. <laughs> <laughs> no, the other one is that complex. All right, so extending. Um, yeah, so there's multiple ways of doing it. So. The, the, the easiest, I would say, is extending as in uh, creating your own site. Uh, I think there's quite a lot of documentation, so we have the training material there, so if you do want to create your own site uh, and extending, so adding views, overriding views, etc., etc., uh, there's all documentation to do that. Um, if you mean extending by um, um, add-on products, as we know them um, uh, in Plone, um, there's multiple ways of doing it. So currently we don't have a full uh, add-on structure in place. Uh, that means that we would like to have um, a structure where you only have to specify which add-ons you want to use and then every configuration and overrides and everything will just be automatically picked up. We don't have that in place yet. Uh, what, you c what you can do is create your own NPM package with uh, certain specific um, views, actions, reducers, uh, you name it, everything you want to do, and import that in your theme package. Uh, so you can definitely do it that way. Um, but yeah, indeed, we're still working on uh, making it even uh, better for developers or easier for developers uh, to work on. Whose question was that? Anyone? Nope. All right. Then I guess we did, we did a good job, right? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> All right, next up is complex layouts. That's yours, Victor. It's mine. Yeah, okay. you're the complex guy. Complex <laughs> layouts. <laughs> the other day I was, um, yeah, I was updating role uh, about, about uh, the, the, our new blocks development, and, and then we, we had a, a nice talk about it. And yeah, I think that some moment in the future we could even treat the frame, with what we call the frame, header, footer, and, and, uh, and the likes as blocks as well at some point, and reuse again the, the uh, uh, concept of layouts that, that the Mosaic uh, intended in the first place, right? So for now, we only have one layout, that is the one that the app APP component is, is, uh, is forcing, but at some point in the future, I we can imagine that we can extend that to be also composable, so you can have uh, several layouts that also uh, defines, as we are defining blocks, you, you can de we can define the different components of a page and the disposition of that page, right? And then pair, I don't know, pair 
route or per content type or things like that. Yeah. So I, I think it's yeah, doable. Um, yeah, I would like to add something. Like the the, the short uh, answer to that is, uh, I would say yes, um, because we did like uh, like two projects, one for like the Humboldt University in Berlin, and they like an agency created a really like complex agency like theme, right? So like super fancy and everything, and and like really hard to uh, to implement with like with modern web technology. Um, and tomorrow I will talk about that in my. Uh, uh, in my talk, so there will there you will see an example of like a complex layout in a, to a certain extent, um, and um, we have another project where, where we also did like quite complex layout, right? R uh, layouts, so, so grid layouts, and um, uh, we have the blocks around, but we're still like trying to to find the right level. Um, uh, of of reusable blocks, right? Because so creating something reusable is really hard. We did that wrong, like quite like a, at the first time we created like a super uber block that can do everything, right? So you add a block there, and you can add that like in a grid row or whatever, and then like later decide what it is if it's a card or like an image or whatever, right? And that was like the the response we got from our client when we get when we went there and we were like super proud what we did, right? They said like. Oh my God, that's way too complex, right? And um, then we like move back to like 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 simpler uh, blocks, right? But they if they're simpler, then they're more um, more uh, client specific, right? So we have to find a good good way in the middle. But still, like the answer is, I think yes, we can all do all kinds of like complex layouts. All right. Whose question was that? Must be Oscar's. No. <laughs> <laughs> Whose question was that? No one here? Oh, yeah, there. Yeah, we have a bit of a light shining in our eyes, so it's not that hard to see. Was it okay? Like was it good? Everything answered? Almost, Almost everything. <laughs> you have some additions? No? no? You can st we'll probably have some time after to add uh, additional questions. All right. Um, next up is event. Instant behavior plus date block, I think. So that's, yeah. Yeah, so events, um, yeah, I think it's, I mean, the type is there, but I mean, the question is, as Timo uh, already said earlier, uh, do we even want types or is it just, we have one, we have a page uh, where you actually add uh, specific fields to or specific blocks to, uh, which makes it a bit different or makes it look different. Uh, and I think the last is definitely something uh, we're going to look uh, the direction we're, we're going to take. Um, so you don't need to create like uh, 40 different uh, content types in your website, but you can just create a page and, and add uh, a date and a start and end date, and which makes it an event, or uh, add a listing to it, which make, kind of makes it a collection, or if you want to say. So, um, yeah, we have we have we have uh, date time widgets. They are already there. They probably need some improvement, um, but uh, at least they are the, the the basics are there. Uh, so you can definitely add events uh, in your site at the moment. Is that questions answered? Not sure whose question it was. Oh. Sorry, did you? He asked if we did an additional uh, content type. Yes, we we basically reused everything that we uh, like. We uh, like that depends on Plone, right? So if you add a custom content type, it will show up in Volto and it will work right away. So any content type that we have in in Plone is also in Volto. Like I I showed a, like a customized version with that like single page, right? I mean that was something that I make made up. Yeah. So all all dexterity content types will just work uh, in Volto as well. So that includes the events, but also news items, images, files, uh, you name it. The, the thing is that probably in the demos you are not seeing it because we de de deliberately uh, remove it because we have um, the widget for the dates are not quite yet and then we had a, an issue with the widget for the event type. So there's a PR for that. I think Andrea was uh, working on it in Sorrento. And uh, yeah, we have to work a little bit more on it. But we didn't want it to show people something that doesn't work well. And then we remove it from the demos and everything. But, but it's there. And, and of course, you can use it 
has any other plum content type. So. Yep. All right. Next up, uh, site with deep content structures, navigation levels. And it's probably more or less the same question as the bottom one, which is why no second level navigation level or drop down menu? Um, who wants to take that one? Sure. Yeah? Um, we're going to do it. But for me, they're like separated, right? <laughs> kind of. Kind of. I mean, yeah. one is. Nah, um, they're more related. So, kind of related. So, how, like, like about the um, deep content structures uh, and navigation levels? Um, so, we deliberately did not implement portlets on Plone REST API and on Volto as well, right? And this is how like Plone 5 handles like deeply nested structure, or it handles it on two ways, right? One is the, like the drop-down menu that we just recently added, and the second is the navigation portlet, right? Um, adding in a navigation portlet or like something that looks like that is like super trivial. One of our interns did that like in half an hour or so, right? So in, in React, it's super simple. You have all the... Uh, all the necessary data in, in Redux anyways, and then you just like display it basically, right? And you just add it to your like main view or where, wherever you want it, right? So that's like super trivial. We could add something like that, um, but since it's so easy to do, um, I don't see any like, uh, like reason that we have that. Um, we can think about like a replacement in general for portlets and how we want to handle that, but that's like a complex topic. Um, so, uh, yeah, we have the option there to, to do that. We could e even resemble what Plone does, does today, right, if we want. Um, there's no technical problem there. I see it's, it's more like a decision what we, what we want to do. So that, that would be, like, easily doable. Uh, and the second question is, like, why no second-level navigation? Um, the only answer I can give there is, like, really my, my, my personal answer. Uh, I don't like those small like drop down menus where when you slip you're like immediately like gone with your mouse, right? I hate that a lot. Um, so what we do with clients when they ask for that is we do those fat drop down menus. Um, and we did that for most of our projects actually because they have like deeply nested structure and then you need something like that, right? Um, though the problem with that is that it's always like kind of client specific. Um, so we implement that like on our own, right? But the good thing is that like it's in React, so it's super simple to like build it for even for every project, right? Um, or like to just reuse something that's already there. Um, so again, it's something that we can decide as a community what we want, right? Do we want a drop-down menu? menu? Do we want a fat menu? Do 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 we want like to keep it like things as they are, right? Um, it's not bound by like any technical. Uh, means and and implementing that in React is a lot easier than in Plone, right? So um, open for discussion, I guess. Yeah, and maybe and maybe at some point we can. So currently we have the, of course, we have the styling of uh, Pastanaka UI, and we have the styling of the the theme, basically the default theme, and we could also ship with multiple themes by default, where maybe one team does use drop downs and the other one uses some fancy navigation uh, thingy. Yeah, yeah. So that's definitely. Uh, um, de definitely doable. All right, now really important question. Is it compatible with Guillotina? It, and the question was not even from, Ram Ram from Ramon, he said, but I don't, I don't trust him, though. <laughs> no, I'll, I'll answer that one to, 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 to start the pillow fight. Um, so the short answer is it's not 100% compatible. Uh, most of the calls are the same. Uh, the APIs are kind of the same, almost the same, slightly different, uh, but I think it's mostly um, has to do with how do we, how can we keep up uh, the APIs in sync, uh, and, and that's a that's a hard question I think because um, both systems are different. Um, if you try to force it in a way so that the API is exactly the same. For me, from a, from a front-end perspective, I'd say it should be easy, doable, uh, but there's always opinions in the back-end. So and I think there's some people with strong opinions, both in the Volto camp and in the Guillotina 10 camp. I'm not going to name any names, but you know who they are. Um, <laughs> so 
if they have more beers together and if they discuss more, or maybe you should have less beers and discuss less, but I don't know. At least if they, <laughs> if they figure out a way to, to make like a generic API, uh, which will work with both systems, then we can definitely get there. Uh, but yeah, so th I don't think there's any technical uh, uh, reasons why it shouldn't be possible, like fully 100% compatible. Um, yeah, I think that's the, that's the answer. So it's not a technical issue. Want, any, want to add anything, Victor? I'm, I'm not giving. I'm not giving Timo the mic. <laughs> yes, it's compatible. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, then the question: migration from Plone X dot X to Volto. Wow, X dot X is not really specific, so it could also be from 1.0. All right. Who wants to do it on that one? You mean? Um. Yeah, um, I mean doable, right? I, I mean we migrated from Plone 4, a lot, lot, lots of client projects from Plone 4 um, to 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 Volto. Uh, we have a migration pipeline based on Transmogrifier that does that. Um, uh, and uh, yeah, of of course it's like uh, the main 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 like problem there is that you have to migrate like from pages to like composite pages, right? So you have like uh, like tiny MCE text field, rich text field, and you have to like migrate that to a, like you want to migrate that to a composite page, right? So that's like one block then uh, where you add everything, right? That's 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 possible. That's doable. Uh, main problems are like uh, cover pages. We migrated from cover to uh, to Volto composite pages, uh, mosaic and the like, right? That's that's a problem. Like uh, even if you would want like like migrating a cover page to a, a Volto like grid block page, whatever, um, would would be doable, but it would be like a lot lot of work, and it wouldn't be anything that you really want to see, right? I mean, resembling a cover page in 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 Volto, it, I mean, uh, it would just look like ugly and old, so we, we don't want that. And then the client wants to like override that. So what we did actually is, um, uh, or what what Rodrigo did, he will give a talk about migrations as well, and he will like cover that how to do those migrations um, in his talk tomorrow. Um, what we did is like we added a post migration step, so we run the entire migration like for everything, and then we add uh, empty pages for. Um, for the, the 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 cover pages, right, or the composite pages, and then in the post um, migration step, you can uh, like add a JSON structure for like every every um, every page and overwrite that, right? Um, so we just overwrite that, and then we can see everything together. Like with we have like all our migrations in the CI, so the CI runs, uh, it uh, migrates everything, then runs the post migration step, adds the uh, the composite pages, right, and then we can show that to the client, and they can even like tinker with the pages on their own and tell us like, okay, we're done, this is how we want the overview page to look like. And then you just go to Plone REST API, drop that, and copy that over into your uh, into your uh, JSON file, and then it's there, right? That's the cool thing about the blocks, which we we haven't talked about that, but we also like, um, yeah, um, we, we use that a lot, right? So, so just like get the response from Plone REST API, copy that over to the file system, and then make Plone pick that up and add that. Um, and that worked quite well for us, so, um, um, yeah. All right. Um, next up is something we're not sure what, what it was. So it says, can I add content via CLI? Whose question was that? No one? All right. Then we're just going to take a guess. So my guess is that it has to do something with maybe like Plone CLI kind of things. Um, and content being views maybe, I don't know, could be. I'm just guessing here. So we don't have something similar to Plone CLI. I guess it would be really nice to have though and not that hard to build actually. Um, so currently if you want to create your own view or uh, action or reducer or anything else which is custom in, uh, in Volto, uh, you basically usually copy over some, ex uh, some existing view and make some changes, but indeed it would be nice to have a blown CLI kind of UI that you can actually just uh, add your own views and etc. Cetera, et cetera. So that's, if somebody's up for that for as a sprint topic, then uh, that would be really nice. Sure. Um, no. <laughs> I, I understood that like differently. Uh, I mean, just adding content to Volto 
is like via Plone REST API, right? I mean, just yeah, to but that's just the backend. Yeah. Okay. I mean, if you want to add like stuff to Volto programmatically, you just use curl or HTTP or whatever, right? And you just do a call, then it's there. Yeah, Python. Yeah. All right. Next up, why semantic UI? Or, uh, what, it's, it's your fault, actually. <laughs> it's my fault, indeed. <laughs> I think, I, I mean, I kind of answered it in my presentation as well. Um, yeah, so when I, had a, when I started with Volto and I wanted to do, uh, wanted to have a look into what CSS framework to use, uh, I, of course, uh, did research on, like, not all of them, but at least all the popular ones. And the main feature I was looking for is um, how easy is it, is it to theme and does it have like a theming support? And, and theming meaning that you can actually override stuff. Um, when looking at all the system, Semantic Yar is actually the only one which had theming like really uh, built in and really well done. I mean, you can, for example, you can do theming and bootstrap, uh, but that basically means you copy over the theme and you change some stuff, and there you have your new theme. Uh, with Semantic UI, you basically derive from a theme, and it, you leave the theme intact, and you override only the stuff which is specific for your own site, um, which we're kind of used to in Plone, or in, in, the, in the Plone, or in the, in the, in the Zope world. Um, so that's, that was actually the main reason to, to, uh, to choose Semantic UI. Uh, another reason was it does really feature complete, so it is actually has a lot more component uh, than, for example, Bootstrap or Material uh, has. So they have, uh, for almost everything, uh, uh, they have a component, um, and they have really great uh, React bindings as well. Uh, so that all the components are there, so you don't need to have any uh, any widget or uh, component. You can just use the semantic UI ones instead of writing your own and maintaining your own, and especially the maintaining part is, of course, uh, for us as a relatively small community, uh, it's really nice if we can use external libraries so we don't have to maintain them. Whose question was that? Anyone who's here? Oh yeah, does it answer the question? Yeah. Yep, perfect. All right, uh, next question. Where do I see the state of my object? Regarding workflow, I guess. Well, this is a question with mm, kind of poignant, right? Um, <laughs> yeah, you can see it in the menu, but you have to click on it. And you can see it also in the bar, uh, in the toolbar. There's a middle, there's a line, and four pixels line, that shows the uh, color code for your uh, the current uh, object. I already had some uh, complaints about that because, yeah, the colors and the um, accessibility about that and the people that are um, colorblind uh, could be a problem. However, Albert did some variations of the current, but that vari variations imply to set, to set some, th to, to place some things in the, outside the CMS UI uh, elements. Oh, sorry, <laughs> elements like, like the, like the toolbar or, or, or the sidebar, and then place the status uh, of the object in the, along with the theme and, and the, the proper content. This is something that we should uh, also continue to work on and to iterate, and we, yeah. It's nothing that is set in stone as, as anything in Volta, and we can, yeah, uh, yeah, as I said, iterate over it and see what's the better uh, approach for it. And, Perfect. All right. So next up, uh, on third-party products, um, how do you plan to keep the back-end part in sync with the Volto front-end part? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, you don't. <laughs> so, I mean, what we could do is create uh, a Python package which includes the, the NPM package as well and have some fancy including everywhere, uh, but it will be a mess. I mean, we made that mistake uh, well over and over and we're just managing uh, JavaScript resources and CSS resources in Plone. Um, and I mean, that's, not, that's just not gonna work. Um, so I think the good thing about Volto is that we actually what we're saying is let's 
do uh, Python in the back end, and we're doing uh, using PyPy, uh, Python package management in the back end, and we're using uh, JavaScript, CSS, um, uh, Jarn, uh, all the package management uh, in the front end, and we use it for the front end. Um, so let's keep them separate. So actually, uh, you use the tools where they're meant to uh, meant for, and not try to make yet another problem uh, with combining them. Um, yeah, I have to keep them in sync. I mean, I'm, I mean, depends on how many projects uh, products you are you have. But if you have like uh, a huge site with a lot of add-on products, maybe it, it is some work to keep them in sync. Uh, on the other hand, I think. Uh, there will probably be a lot of um, uh, add-ons which are only in the back end or only in the front end. Uh, so um, I don't think there will be that many pro uh, products uh, which have both a back end and a front end component. And if they do, yeah, it's not. I don't think it's that hard to uh, to keep both lists uh, in there. So it's a manual job, and it's intentionally manual job. Anything to add? No. Whose question was it? Yeah. Question answered. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. My main concern is like uh, right now we have everything in one package that has views and and site setup. Yeah. So. Um, Right now we have uh, on one package the the view part, the back end, some site setup tools, whatnot. Mm -hmm. So when you, usually when you update to a new a new version product, you kind of do the whole thing in the same place and you go to the new version. And right when when we start seeing all these third party products uh, appearing in this new um, environment. Um, it could happen that you upgrade the backend side, and then you need to be sure that the version on the front end is going to be compatible and yep, it's going to keep that's working. True. No, it's definitely. I mean, it, it's something which which you indeed have to look into because the um, it, it could be that I mean the only f the only thing which is uh, um, uh, which is um, which is required is that the API will more or less either be the same or at least be compatible with the front end and back end. So it, it also depends if you create an add-on uh, package, if you make the front end like really specific to a certain back end calls or if you make it uh, more robust. So it could actually maybe handle like the current version, but also like uh, some version in between or an older version. Um, and I, I mean, I don't think that like, usually the API doesn't change that much. Uh, and if it doesn't, it's probably like a major version in which you'll probably know uh, that something needs to be changed. Uh, but yeah, it, it's something which you maybe have to do with trial and error to, to fix it indeed. Yeah. Um, I can maybe add something from first hand experience because like we had that, like we created uh, like two add on products already, like Kit Concept Zero, where like you have like a back end part where you add uh, like behavior for like uh, meta description, meta title, and those kind of things, right? Um, and then like a front end part, and we thought about like hook, like creating hooks like on the front end and stuff. But since it's relatively easy to just override a few like files, we left it like it is. It's something that we definitely want to look in. But it's like you can write those add-on products. And the second example is Collective Solar, right? And the right level of abstraction, like most of the time, is the REST API, right? I mean, this is what we did for 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 Plone Core, right? REST API makes a lot of sense. Um, to have the back end like separate from the front end because think about like 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 solar right you have like an endpoint that like returns everything and the solar structure but then it depends on like the front end that you're building right maybe you are using Volto but maybe you are using like something else on the front end like Vue or something right so you don't you want the back end part but you don't necessarily want the front end part right and we don't want to prevent anybody to like use Vue or Angular or whatever right we're like Use whatever you want, right? This is what, why we have the REST API. This is the flexibility that the REST API gives us. And the same is true for like the other way around. Maybe you create like a front end package like for like uh, for another back end. Maybe you want to use Elasticsearch, right? And there are tons of like awesome libraries for specifically for Elasticsearch and for Solar, right? That gives you widgets for like everything, right? I mean, just like Google for that. And it's like awesome what, what you have, right? And if we would enforce our choices to to 
to, to everybody, right? By like binding those two together, we would lose a lot of flexibility and also make it hard for people to move on. Because this is like what I did before in Collective Solar, right? I started to add like different front ends for different Plone versions. So I had like views for Plone 4, views for Plone 5, uh, classic Plone views, uh, React views and everything. And then suddenly you add like 10 different versions in your like package, right? And that's just a mess. And we have the REST API, and that's the right level of abstraction, and we should use that right level of, abs of abstraction, right? Greg, um, I'm thinking a follow-up uh, on this. Um, yesterday, I believe, uh, was you, Philip, that uh, mentioned about some having something like at runtime saying, go to a, um, uh, like a shop of, of third-party products, and doing it this way will make us go farther uh, away from that idea, because I, if I understand correctly, if you have, let's say, four different add-ons on Volto, you you need to create a Volto app that depends on all those packages and Volto and, cre and, and compile it and, and serve it, right? So that idea yeah, gets it. Yeah. farther away, right? <laughs> That's true, but um, that's like by purpose because um, like the bundling process is really important to like keep the bundle small and allow Webpack to do things like tree shaking and stuff, right? So I think it's like almost like nuts to like ship a modern like JavaScript application and not bundle, right? And the other option that we have is like to create something like resource registries, right? I mean, what, what we did there, right? Let, let the bundle run like on your browser with like npm or whatever with arbitrary packages and who here wants that <laughs> so <laughs> that's not going to happen we don't want it and we won't do it right then uh, again remember that we are talking about a lower level on uh, on add-on packages for example we, we are talking what remember that we um, bash everything regarding UI out of the add-on. So the add-on is, uh, as I said in my talk, it's only content types, uh, generic setup, uh, serializers and the serializers, and maybe some endpoint, right, that you need. And it's, it's contract, it's API. So uh, it's not going to change that that often, I will say. And still, uh, it happens also when you uh, are uh, working with Plone right now, you, you pull a uh, uh, an add-on, and then you do the customization over that add-on. Maybe uh, with JBot, you're, you're customizing templating, right? So you don't have to do that because you do it in, in the Bolto part. And, um, and you also, sp are, 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 uh, the, the process spares you to do that also. So, so basically, it's, also, it's going to be also not that uh, difficult to do, and it's not going to change that often, I think. I mean, it's I guess we have to know when, when people start using Volto more in production websites and if more add-ons will show up and see where we go in there from there. Yeah. I can also add, so I have some first-hand experience regarding this uh, shop idea because we built uh, for a client a large like application in Angular 2 where they had that idea to like offer their clients like lots of different enterprise packages all in Angular 2 and we like they ask us to like build a shop like system so you can go to, to that and say like, I want this app I want that app right and then dynamically it works right but the thing is then you can't bundle that and you have to like create different bundles and stuff that's incredibly incredibly complex and it's like impossible al almost to have that app then in a performant way right so you will like totally screw it up so it's n definitely nothing that I would recommend I mean we did that it's doable but I would never do that for Plone that would be like a horrible thing to do no yeah. all right uh, well this is already last question at least on the paper um, we couldn't read it though it says description field in and then there's a word and it could be Paris but description field in Paris doesn't sound like a real question to me, but uh, who's, do you know whose question it was? It was mine. Yeah. I was looking for the description field for the Volto page, but uh, I found, found it in the old version of Volto, but not in the old new. Yeah, so indeed, so uh, Volto um, 
there's basically two ways of, of, of editing a photo. I mean, as we're used to in the plum world, we always need to have at least two ways of doing the same. But um, no, I'm, I'm just kidding. But it's uh, so we have the visual editing part where all the blocks are, um, and you can still uh, edit uh, with a normal form. Uh, so if you just add a, a, a just a news item or just I don't know like a, like an image or a file that that will just render a form and it will still have the description and it will still have the title etc cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, in Volto, um, in, in Volto, in the visual editor, basically where we have blocks, um, the description is not uh, not in the, not by default in the in interface. Um, uh, what you want to do with the description is, I guess, you could uh, specify it specifically for that page or uh, auto-generate it based on the content. And I think the last option would make more sense because I guess in most pages people don't fill in the description because it's just yeah, just an extra field. It will just go to the content. Um, but uh, yeah, that's something which you can also um, uh, fix in your view, so you can actually in your view, or maybe in the REST API, you can probably also do it to check if the description is empty and then show and then return uh, like a summary or the first uh, paragraph of your of your rich text, for example. Does it answer your question? Yeah, perfect. So, do we have any other question? Or oh, you want to go in this one? I was just wanted to add that yeah, you sure. can. You can bring it back. It didn't go anywhere. Only it was only not in the default content, but it's also not in the tile chooser because we choose to do that. But you can bring it back. It's configuration, so if you need it. Um, the reason why we removed it in the first place was because like it, we had a like hard to solve UX problem, right? Because if you if you create a new page, you have the title. Uh, and then you have the description, right? And then you enter the title, you hit return, and then w what do you do? I mean, do you create a, like a text tile or do you move to the to the description tile? And then next time that, that that's like kind kind of like magic that one time a, you, when you hit return, you move to the next uh, block that is there, the description uh, block, or you like create a new one, right? And that like. That was like really hard to solve that that problem. Or where where does the description field then has to be, right? Does it has to be like on the top always, like and it's fixed? Is it like required, or like can we move it around? And then we need to do something that 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 is done in Mosaic, right? Like uh, connect like a field with uh, with with a uh, with a tile, right? And that introduced like lots of complexity and the feedback that we got from our clients was that like the description is like some kind of metadata and what worked really well for us was like as Rob described right to like separate the two and tell the the, the clients uh, so this field is for like the overview like pages and put whatever you want on the um, on the page itself that was something that clients asked us a lot for and I think it makes makes a lot of sense uh, as a default but it's open for debate all right. Um, anyone else have any questions? Oh, lots of them. Good. OK, now that you are all duty are there, I want to repeat the question from the previous talk. That was, now that TypeScript, seems that TypeScript has won the, the JavaScript language wars. So have you had any thought about that, supporting that in the future? Y yes. <laughs> so I think I. I think there was a question on, on my talk as well, uh, indeed. And um, so, to what happened a lot in Plone is that we actually create new concept of doing the same, and which is really good. And then we still keep the old uh, way of doing it, and that's really bad. Um, and we try to avoid doing the same thing in Volto. So we try to uh, not jump on the bandwagon too soon that we're actually saying, okay, we want to support this new technology and we're going to deprecate the old one but still be able to support it. Um, I think TypeScript is uh, something which I'm not 100% sure if they won. I mean, I think it, it definitely looks promising um, and a lot of people are using it. There's still also a lot of people who are still, still I would say, year six. I mean, there's also still a relatively new, uh, new technology, but a lot of people still use uh, ES6 as well. Um, and I mean, what could be is that 
ES 7 or 8 or whatever they're going to call the new version might be uh, might take a lot of concepts from uh, from TypeScript like we had with CoffeeScript for example. So CoffeeScript was like a variant with a lot of people really liked and then uh, the, the ECMAScript standard took a lot of those ideas so that, and now CoffeeScript is I think completely dead. I'm not sure if anybody uses it anymore but I'm, I can imagine something happening the same with TypeScript as well. Maybe not, maybe, maybe it could or maybe it doesn't. Um, so but the short answer is well if TypeScript is here to stay, and maybe in a year or two, then it's still there. Then uh, yes, we probably uh, do uh, switch to TypeScript, um, but that will probably mean that we're write, rewriting the whole code base in in, uh, in TypeScript, and also updating all the documentation that all the new developers should write, do it in TypeScript. So we don't have like 20 ways of doing the same. Yeah. Um, I I would like to like stress a fact. Um, uh, when when I like uh, started to learn like uh, like the like ZCL like the new like uh, ZCA and stuff when it was introduced right what scared the hell out of me was that you could like register components like both on like a Python level and then on ZCML right that was long before Grok and everything right and then like so you could register a component on on Python level you could do it on ZCML and then we put like two or three other layers on top of that right so I think like I think we have four five ways of doing that right and that was like as an as like a relative newbie actually I was quite, I was quite experienced already but <laughs> like I was like that that was like that totally confusing me right and we kind of have the same problem with, with our interns right now, right? With with just React. So, like, 99% of all documentation for React is like ES6, right? So, like, all the documentation, all like all screencasts that you have, like uh, like Acadio, like courses and everything, it's like without TypeScript, right? Um, and um, we kind of already have the problem with like if you're in the React community, like the the hot thing is like uh, is hooks, right? So like from class-based component, they move to f uh, function-based component and using hooks, right? And that's already something that in our company for the interns is is a hard problem, right? Explaining them that like if they look around, right, they like they do what like also experienced developers do, like they look at Stack Overflow and stuff, right? And then there's one example with class-based components and another one with hooks, right? And then they're like, okay, wh what shall I do now, right? And then you have to explain them both, right? And that totally sucks. And imagine when we put then TypeScript on top of that, right? Then we have like lots of components again. So we had that question last year already. And I, th I really like the, like, like what we said at the end that when like create React app, which is like the standard starter for React, if they move to TypeScript, and like TypeScript is really everywhere, then we will move to TypeScript, right? But before that, I wouldn't do that. All right, I think there was another question there. Uh, just related to the uh, question before, um, is there any plan that you can have components or wall to components, so client-side related, uh, but not active, so so like we have with the quick installer, so the, the deployment can provide certain things and the, the users or the admin users uh, can then enable certain functionalities so that you ship Volto with a richer functionality. So it's not just what the client were asking for and, and the, you need a developer to, to have this. Because if you have this, uh, it's fine to separate the things, in, use the JavaScript way to install JavaScript packages and uh, Python way to install Python. But then I can imagine that we would have a small link uh, so that the maybe the JavaScript component I activate can go to the backend and say, I want this backend component also to activate so they can ac actually store my data. Uh, that would be really helpful because <laughs> We don't need to have the same shop experience, uh, clicky bundi like uh, like WordPress. Uh, we don't want to install the universe uh, um, uh, by click. But I really like uh, the way how uh, tools like Odoo does. They they basically ship with everything. It's like a full build out with a lot of packages and add-ons. And then you go and say, I want that, and then you enable it. It's basically enabling functionality. It's not going anywhere and sucking add-ons from the internet. This is really nice. Yeah, yeah I, I can answer. So, uh, well, just a question actually. So what, what would be the use case? So 
Um, when when looking at like WordPress or something, I can imagine because everybody just installed installed WordPress and uh, does some stuff with it, and it's usually uh, like a smaller site or at least uh, something which is. Uh, I guess easily are maintained by just the, the the web editor himself and just maybe some small hacking in there. But I think most uh, blown websites are not like that. I think most blown websites are actually uh, uh, made by uh, companies or uh, or uh, or consultants who actually know what they're doing. And I think that's mostly they know how to to set up an instance and to to fetch packages from everywhere. So I don't. I'm not sure what what the use case will be uh, if we do it like that because that would also mean that uh, y there's like you, you need multiple steps of enabling the add-on, so you actually have to install it, and then you also need to, from a UI perspective, you need to install it. Um, and I personally, I don't see that advantage, but that maybe because I don't have that use case. But yeah, I mean, sure, everything can be built. <laughs> um, yeah, but I don't. I d currently I don't see the the the, um, the the benefit of of having something available like that. Yeah, but maybe we should have a beer and have, and talk about your use case later. <laughs> All right. Uh, did you think about uh, naming convention for for add-ons and because at some point you will have. Um, I mean, not to repeat the 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 issue we have now in Plon. Because we have collective, but nobody associate that name with Plon, or only we do that. Also, in the future, you to separate add-ons developed by community by add-ons developed by the core or team. I think we made already made that mistake. I think we have a Plon organization on npm, and we have a collective organization on npm. <laughs> 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 I'm not sure if it's a mistake, though. But yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah, so I think that's the answer. So, so we have a plone organization in uh, on npm where you that's where you also see like the add plone forward slash photo package uh, where you want to install them. So all the packages which are in within the plone organization are uh, well under the plone umbrella, so maintained by plone. And there's a collective organization where uh, people can put uh, collective or their own code in. And you can also, of course. Uh, Create your own organization or no organization at all, which most packages are. They don't have a namespacing. Um, yeah, so we're not forcing it, and you can more or less see where the packages uh, are coming from and who maintains them. Yeah. Unless you know question. Yeah. At, at least to to keep Volto name in the add-ons name or. I don't know to start with Volto minus yeah. add-on minus something. Yeah, I guess. I forgot what I was about to say. <laughs> um, <laughs> seriously. <laughs> we can do a rap battle in between. Yep. No. <laughs> <laughs> More questions? Any other questions? First of all, uh, thank you for your work on modernizing Plone. Um, my question is regarding accessibility. Have you checked or evaluated the accessibility of Volto regarding screen readers and so on? I'm the only one with a mic. Um, so <laughs> uh, yes, we did. So uh, at, uh, I think it was in Tokyo, right? Or was it at a sprint after? I can't remember. After. After, yep. all right. Oh, you have yeah. a mic now, you can answer yeah. that one. <laughs> uh, yeah, we, we actually, we, we put a considerable amount of, of work into accessibility because um, we do a lot of like like government side and like uh, university sites and stuff like that. So and, and accessibility is, is always a requirement, right? Um, and we started, I think we started to discuss it in Tokyo maybe. And then at the Beethoven Sprint, Paul, I, and like a few other folks like sat together. Um, and uh, Victor already like worked on a few things, so we basically like set up static code analysis uh, based on A11YX, 
which is like a yeah, static code analysis tool that analyzes the source code and checks for like A11Y. Uh, violations, we were able to fix all, all of them uh, during the sprint, uh, during the Beethoven sprint. Um, then I also added um, Cypress X, which is like Cypress is like a like robot framework, like acceptance testing framework written in JavaScript. Um, and uh, there's an X, uh, X so an accessibility uh, check add-on uh, where you actually can like go to to a page or like do some action and then check if there are any accessibility problems, right? So we have like those tests in place. So we test on two levels already, like the um, static code analysis and on an acceptance testing level. Um, though that's not not enough, so we manually actually we actually manually um, check our our websites, our client websites, and we try to like merge back everything that we can um, into Volto. Um, and uh, the Plum Foundation is currently trying to like, um, Paul, am I allowed to like say that on stage? Like talk about that? <laughs> I won't tell you. <laughs> Paul? Paul's not here. Okay, so so there's a possible like funding project uh, from the like European Union um, to like actually do a, like uh, an accessibility audit for Plon, uh, for Volto actually. So we will get an audit, and actually on like two of our client projects we already got audits or we will get audits, uh, also accessibility audits, right? Because I said it's it's really important. So it's something that is there. We don't have like the official audit or approval. Um, but it's definitely there, and it should should work, right? And if it doesn't, then let us know. Any other questions? One more. Oh, we have to stop. Yeah. Oh, we're already late. Sorry. No more questions. If you still have any other questions later on, you'll know where to find us. Yeah. All right. Thank you.